Welcome to Frontline Faith, where culture meets faith and real life challenges are faced head on. I'm your host, Pastor Ryan, a 20 year Army veteran and over two decades in ministry, bringing a unique perspective to the intersection of faith, culture, and the battlefield of life. Join me each week as we tackle tough issues, engage in honest conversations, and explore how we can live boldly in light of God's truth. You're listening to Frontline Faith. Welcome back. Today, we're diving into two critical and timely issues that intersect faith and culture, the power of political rhetoric and its consequences, and the toll PTSD takes on our veterans. And finally, we'll tie these conversations to the idea of living life quorum deo. It's a Latin phrase. Stick around to find out more. For this first segment, I want to talk about the dangers of of political rhetoric. Most of you know it's been in the news for the past several days. There has been a second assassination attempt on former President Trump. I want to walk through the timeline of events as we know it. On uh, September 15th, 2024, early in the morning, 1.59 a.m. approximately, Ryan Wesley Routh's or Ruth's cell phone records indicate that he was present at the Trump International Golf Club there in West Palm Beach, Florida. He remained there hidden in the bushes and the trees for nearly 12 hours. Uh, midday that day, September 15th, there was a security alert. Um, he's this, this individual is a convicted felon. He spotted near the golf course with an AK-47 style rifle and Secret Service agents then identify him as a potential threat. Many media outlets are saying no shots are fired, uh, but the alleged assassin, uh, he pointed his weapon at law enforcement. There was a scope. There was a, a barrel that was seen. Secret Service quickly intervenes, and they prevent the assassination attempt. That afternoon, 2.14, he is pulled over by law enforcement while attempting to leave the area. He acknowledges knowing why he was stopped and is subsequently arrested without incident. The vehicle he was driving was found to be stolen. There was an investigation on September 16th. Federal and local law enforcement agencies, including the FBI and the Palm Beach Sheriff's Office, launched this full-scale investigation, interviews and uh, uh, with witnesses and the family uh, members of this individual. And it's it's a lot, right? Um there's these ongoing issues. Uh, this individual is charged with unlawful possession of a firearm as a convicted felon. Uh, the Justice Department is involved in the case, pledging to ensure accountability. Uh, former President Donald Trump thanked Secret Service on X uh, for their swift action, and he talks about this at length um, on X and other outlets now. The, I guess the current director of Secret Service says that the golf course was not, I guess, totally sweeped um, in, in all but saying, you know, we don't have enough officers, things like that. The, for, uh, the current president has said Secret Service needs help. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's more officers. I, I want to talk about just why we're here, where we're at uh, at this present time in our country. It is a dangerous, dangerous place to be when people attempt to assassinate political leaders. I think it stems from rhetoric being used. Now, if you watch CNN or MSNBC or any of the, I guess, left-leaning news outlets, they have pivoted from the first assassination attempt in July and saying, hey, you know, protect our, our political individuals. Now they're saying with this attempt, well, Trump needs to back down and his his group needs to apologize. And he's now, <laughs> instead of the victim, he's now the perpetrator uh, of a second assassination attempt on himself. I want to just highlight some things. Rhetoric is important when we use it uh, in the media, when we use it on, you know, 
uh, interviews, things like that. Several politicians have compared Donald Trump to an authoritarian figure like Hitler. Uh, Mussolini uh, described him as a threat to democracy, an existential threat to the United States. This is not okay. Uh, the more people hear this, the more you say this, the more people hear this, more actions will be taken because of the rhetoric, and the media is allowing it to happen. Uh, our current president, Joe Biden, has repeatedly framed Trump and his movement as an existential threat to democracy, uh, particularly in the 2020 campaign uh, and you know beyond since then. In speeches, uh, President Biden has argued that Trump's actions, especially around the 2020 election, demonstrate his willingness to undermine democratic norms. Kamala Harris, vice president, running for president, uh, has joined in this rhetoric describing Trump as a significant danger to the future of American democracy. Their rhetoric, uh, rhetoric often points to Trump's actions uh, and his words, but it's not okay to say he's an existential threat or a threat to democracy. He's been in office. He was the president for four years, and there was no threat to democracy. Nancy Pelosi, former Speaker of the House, has highly uh, uh, touted and been uh, very critical of Trump, likening him to authoritarian leaders, and she's uh, referred to him uh, as a danger to our democracy, a threat to our democracy. There have been people all over the news today that they found news bites thing that Trump needs to be eliminated. All these things, it's not okay to say against your political opponent uh, with that said, here we go. I want to discuss the importance that words have in shaping our hearts, but also our actions. Faith meets culture. What does the Bible say about rhetoric and the way we use words and sentences and statements against others? Here's some Proverbs, and this is just from the book of Proverbs. There are many other passages uh, that refer to the tongue and taming of the tongue, but Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 15, 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. If you continue down a political rhetoric that is dangerous for others, it stirs up anger and hate and evil uh, uh, in all kinds of ways. Proverbs 15, 4, the soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. Proverbs 16, 24, gracious words are a honeycomb, sweet to the soul and healing to the bones. Proverbs 18, 21, the tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Proverbs 21, 23, those who guard their mouths and their tongues keep themselves from calamity. The divisive nature of the current political rhetoric leads to dangerous outcomes, including violence that we've already seen. I want to challenge you uh, and, and myself and the political leaders listening. Consider how we use our words. Do our words promote peace? Do they promote understanding? Do they divide or harm or bring about evil actions? Words matter, sentences matter, statements matter, political turmoil, and the rhetoric that we use matters. Get back to the issues. What's about what's going on with the economy? What's going on with the border? What's going on with our, our kids and, and educational future? Like go back to the important things. Stop the rhetoric. Both sides need to take a step back and realize that their words move people. The media needs to take a step back and realize that. What they put on the air matters. It moves people. Like here, here's a here's just a warning to everyone listening to this podcast: the media that you watch, the music you listen to, the movies you watch, like whatever it is, it's it's there to move you, to influence you, to do something, to vote a certain way, to buy a certain thing. Unplug and just <laughs> focus on what matters. Your faith matters. Your family matters, right? Your neighbor matters. I want to shift gears here now and talk about some of our neighbors. PTSD in our military and our armed forces is a huge topic. It's something that's been weighing on my heart, but also the nation's heart for years uh, through the Afghanistan war, the uh, war in Iraq, the 
you know, Vietnam, even World War II, uh, men and women who have served. It is PTSD. So what is it? Um, it is a mental condition triggered by experiencing or witnessing traumatic events. And in this case that we're talking about, uh, war, military, things of that nature. For military personnel, this is often includes the horrors of combat, the loss of brothers and sisters in arms, or even life-threatening experiences. According to statistics here, um, as of 2023, roughly 11 to 20% of veterans from Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom experience PTSD, I would add inherent resolve. And to our current vice president, yes, we still have troops that are in combat operations around the world. Pay attention to what's going on. Around 30% of Vietnam veterans um, say they have experienced PTSD. I would say that would be a lot higher than that. Uh, Gulf War veterans, around 12%. The suicide rate among veterans is over 50% higher than that of the general population, with an average of 17 veterans dying by suicide every day. These numbers are heartbreaking, but they paint a clear picture of how profound the impact of trauma can be on those who've sacrificed so much for their country. I want to kind of pause here and say, I don't really share a lot about my background on the podcast. And I may do an episode of just, you know, kind of my, just my story. Um, I've experienced being deployed in a combat zone, uh, uh, doing, uh, participating in combat operations. And I wasn't the guy kicking doors in, but I did experience life threatening moments and circumstances. And I still deal with those today. And I, I'm going to, PTSD is very, very real. And I wish no one, not even my worst enemy, the, uh, the effects that it has on the brain, on the body, emotionally, physically, um, it affects so much of a person's day that's walking through P PTSD. Um, but beyond the clinical symptoms, um, flashbacks, nightmares, anxiety, you know, those are just a few there's often a deep spiritual toll. You know, many many veterans experience feeling uh, uh, um, feelings of guilt, shame, isolation, the sense of having witnessed or participated in things that feel impossible to reconcile, can lead some even to question who they are, question life itself, but question their faith, their purpose, or even find a place in this world. I mean, think about what you've experienced in a combat zone in war. And you come back home, that doesn't equate to employment. That doesn't equate to integrating back into a family. Uh, for current service members, the constant stress of deploying and the weight of responsibility can heighten the risk of PTSD. It's more than just a psychological battle. It's a spiritual warfare. The enemy wants to drive them into despair. But this is where the message of the gospel shines the brightest as believers, we hold on to the hope that Jesus Christ is the ultimate healer. He promises peace and that transcends understanding. And no wound, physical, emotional, or spiritual, is too deep for his love to heal. Psalm 34, 18 reminds us, The Lord is close to the heartbroken and saves those who are crushed in spirit. This promise is especially true for those suffering from PTSD. Churches and faith-based organizations can play a vital role in supporting veterans. Providing community, a sense of isolation, often deepens the wound of PTSD. The body of Christ can offer veterans a place of acceptance and belonging. Faith-based counseling. While secular therapy is important, integrating a biblical worldview into treatment can provide deeper healing. Christian counselors can help veterans see that God's grace covers even the deepest traumas and regrets the wounds of war scriptural encouragement pointing veterans to god's word reminds them of their identity in christ romans 8 38 and 39 assures us that neither death nor life nor angels nor demons nothing will be able to separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus next i would say hey prayer and support the power of prayer is transformative families friends and church members can stand in the gap interceding for veterans and providing consistent encouragement. If you're listening today and you're a veteran and or you know someone who is battling PTSD, know that there's hope in Jesus. 
His love is stronger than any trauma, and His grace is sufficient for every wound. Reach out to your local church, a Christian counselor, a support group. Remember, you don't have to carry this burden alone. The path to healing might be long, but Christ walks it with you. Stay connected to Him, and let His peace bring transformation to your heart and to your mind. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. There's no greater words than Jesus. Hey, again, listeners, be proactive in supporting veterans through compassion, through prayer, through mental health advocacy. Uh, if you know someone, say something, walk with them, uh, be with them, help them find a community, help them find people that can walk with them and listen to them. And it might be you. You might be walking around saying, you know, I could do more uh, for my neighbor. Maybe this is the call to action for you. Last up, I want to talk about a Latin phrase, quorum Deo. At its core, quorum Deo means living in the presence of God, under his authority and to his glory. It reminds us that there is no part of our lives hidden from him, whether we are at work, with family, or alone in our thoughts. Everything we do is in his sight. Psalm 139, 1 through 3, gives us a beautiful picture of this reality. It says, You have searched me, Lord. You know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. David acknowledges that God's presence is inescapable. His knowledge of us is intimate, and his sovereignty extends to every aspect of our existence. Quorum Deo reminds us that nothing in our lives is outside of God's view. How do we live our life consciously before the face of God, aware that everything we do think that we say is in his sight? Think about the political rhetoric that's going on, how we use our words when we speak we do so in the presence of God. Words matter to God, and the way we engage in political discourse should reflect that we are accountable to Him. Not only that, quorum Deo is this, this concept implies that life before God is one of constant awareness of His holiness. Isaiah 6, 1 through 5, Isaiah finds himself in the presence of God and is immediately struck by his own sinfulness he cries out woe to me i am ruined for i am a man of unclean lips and i live among a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty isaiah's reaction shows us that living before god is not a casual thing there are so many people who go through life monday through sunday and they're like you know what it's not really that important i'm just going to go do my thing and not really worry about anything else when we truly grasp God's holiness, we see our own sin in a new light. This awareness should drive us to repentance, but also to gratitude. Through Christ, we can stand before God without fear. In Hebrews 4.13, the writer tells us, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him to whom we must give an account. This is a sobering reminder that living quorum Deo means that living a uh, life should be a life of integrity. We cannot hide behind pretense or hypocrisy. God sees through all our actions and motivations, which calls us to live authentically, striving to reflect Christ in all things. But also those suffering from PTSD, we can find solace in knowing that God is with us in our darkest moments. Veterans and their families can live quorum Deo, assured of God's constant presence and care even when life feels overwhelming. You see, living quorum Deo also means that we recognize God is the ultimate authority over our lives. This is not just about obeying His commandments, but about submitting to His will in everything. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, Paul writes to the church and he says this, For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him, 
and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul is speaking of Jesus Christ here. The passage reminds us that everything, our time, our talents, our resources, and even our very lives belong to him. He is sovereign over all, and therefore our entire existence should be lived in submission to him, even our PTSD. Jesus himself modeled this perfect submission to the Father's will. In John 5, 19, he says this, Very truly I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. If Christ, the Son of God, who is very God and very man, lived his life entirely under the authority of the Father, how much more should we seek to align our will with his? If you're listening to this podcast, I want you to live in this awareness, Coram Deo, that our speech, our actions, how we care for others, the relationship that we have with God, it is all to be lived in the authority of God. No matter the struggle, whether it's our words or our wounds, we are invited to live our lives, Coram Deo, in God's presence, where we can find both accountability we can also find grace. As we wrap up today's episode, I want to pause and consider the weight of the things that have been discussed here. We started by examining the dangers of political rhetoric in light of the recent assassination attempt on former President Trump. It's a reminder that our words hold tremendous power, power to build up or power to tear down, power to create peace or to fuel violence. Proverbs reminded us that the tongue has the power of life and death. And in the, this divisive time, as followers of Christ, we're called to steward our speech with wisdom and grace. Those words that we speak, whether in public or private, have lasting impact. Are we using our words to bring healing or harm? This is the question we must ask ourselves every day. Next, we turn to a heavy topic, PTSD, and its toll on our military veterans. Men and women uh, have sacrificed so much for our country, and many return home to face battles that they are far less visible and no less deadly. The statistics are staggering. Around 17 veterans take their own lives. That's 17 souls every single day crushed under the weight of trauma. For those of us in the faith community, this cannot be a silent tragedy. We are called to be agents of comfort to Come alongside our veterans, reminding them in that even in their darkest moments, God is near the brokenhearted. If you're listening to this podcast and you're battling PTSD, know this. There is hope and there is help. Jesus calls to you, offering rest for your weary soul. But perhaps the greatest takeaway from today is that no matter what we face, whether it's the violence stirred by reckless words or the silent wounds of trauma, we are all called to live our lives, quorum Deo, before the face of God. When we live quorum Deo, we recognize that every word we speak, every action we take, and every burden that we bear is done in the presence of the one who created us. And he sees it all, and he cares deeply for us. So, let us be mindful of our words, knowing that we will give an account for them. Let us support and care for our veterans, acknowledging the unseen battles they face. And above all, let us live each moment in light of God's presence, knowing that he is with us, guiding us, sustaining us, and reminding us of the grace that is ours in Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me today on Frontline Faith, where faith and culture meet. Till next time, may we walk in the presence and peace of God, living each day quorum Deo.